Hi, welcome to episode 161 of Monday Night Chat. Uh, you know, we've been having a lot of discussion with my officers and uh, my interns. They're giving back uh, feedback. What we're, we're going to try to do in the next couple of weeks is transition into a shorter Monday Night Chat. We're going to try for today, we're going to try this rapid fire Q&A session. Uh, we're also, uh, as an introduction, we're going to reintroduce one of our interns, uh, currently we have five interns, we're going to reintroduce Iskandar. So before that, let me just invite all the officers and interns who are our big happy family at the moment. Let's bring them in. Hi guys, good. Yep. So at the yep. bottom left, right, that's Iskandar there. Iskandar wave. Yeah, okay. So Iskandar, you want to say something about your second tour of duty? Go ahead. Yes. Hello everyone, um, I am Iskandar, it's good to be back and it's nice to meet my new intern friends and I've been here for about four months, so longer than my previous stint before, so I hope I'll get to learn and contribute more lah to the Subang office. Okay, fantastic Iskandar. Four months ah, is it right? Yeah? yeah, about that lah, about that. Okay, 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 good. So we're looking forward to uh, Iskandar. Actually, we offered Iskandar after his first internship to come and join my office. So that offer is still open. And hopefully when he graduates, he will become an officer in our office also. Okay? So let's try the new format, which is Q&A, but rapid fire. Okay? Is that transition right, thing we're going to do? No. Yes, there is. Okay, Bala, explain to us what is rapid fire. I mean, the questions come in, how many minutes do I have to answer them? Okay, so the process is very simple. Um, so we will start with the interns asking each one question. And boss, you will have to answer the question within a minute. Uh, wow. So if, I mean, we'll give you two minutes max, lah, right? <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but but some we, we understand that some questions require some explanation. But yeah, we'll try to keep it within the minute. Uh, we do not have a countdown today, but we will start having countdown <laughs> later on. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Who's gonna start? So we'll start. We'll start some of the interns. Uh, I think the first one should be Wen. Wen, are you ready? Hmm. All right. So, um, based on the World Bank and IMF, they forecast that Malaysia's economy will grow by around five point five percent, which is also in line with the. Uh, BNM Bank Negara Malaysia's uh, 53 to 63 percent. On what basis did they make this prediction? Okay, they look at a lot of data. Of course, economic data is important. They look at unemployment numbers, consumption, and all this kind of thing. But they also rely on Bank Negara data itself, right? So uh, Bank Negara will base their data on Dawson Department stats, okay? Trade data is very important for Malaysia because we're an export nation. So overall, they all try to make a prediction and they need to actually revise that number every quarterly. Yeah? So I would assume that this prediction started either end of December and then another time again in March. But now we're in, in June and we, we are seeing you know, the impact of the Ukraine war. So this kind of thing has to be factored in. I'll be very surprised if we hit 5 point something. We'll probably have to scale down by a few percentage points, like maybe 1 to 2%. And there's global stagflation coming also. So those are going to impact international trade. So that's how they do it. They go through economic data. They make prediction. They look at fiscal position. They look at growth. They look at trade. And then they have to revise it from time to time. Okay? So it's not set in stone as 5.5. When people predict. Lah, yeah? So IMF, of course, predict because they are giving short-term loans. World Bank predict because they're giving long-term loans. And the Malaysian government predict to give confidence or to warn the investors and also consumers on whether to tighten budget or to spend more or to be relaxed, whatever it is. It's normal. They all predict. Okay? Next question. I hope that's one minute. Um, the next question is, uh, recently, market researchers have found an abnormal situation in the stock market. So do you think this is a pre-election phenomenon? Okay, the stock market generally is three to six months ahead. When I was growing up in the, you know, in the 1990s as a young lawyer, we used to say the stock market predicts about six months ahead. Lah. Now, it's even shorter and shorter cycle. So, it could be three months. 
So what the stock, what influenced the stock market are news such as the cyber dynamic scandal or saga, right? So and how the authorities react to it. If the authorities don't take drastic action, then it will dampen the market's in, in, uh, feeling. At the moment, what we know for certain is that a lot of foreign investors who buy stocks in Malaysia are leaving. Uh, they are either putting the money back in America for interest rate reason, or they view is the country is unstable, no direction. The typical complaint, lah. You can ask any uncle, auntie outside, outside there. They will tell you, yeah, I don't feel good about. It. So confidence is very important in this kind of thing. Yeah. So the stock market will go up and down based on confidence, and it will be based on uh, on general economic pressure, but internal internal uh, issues such as cyber dynamic. Even the RAM uh, being take, taken over by CTOS, where the authorities are being shown to be less concerned or not taking a critical view, that also can dampen the market. Okay, next question. Okay, um, so recently there was the news about reintroduction of GST. Do you think it is necessary to introduce GST at the current state of Malaysian economics, and how will people be affected by it? Okay, well, GST, uh, it was introduced by Najib, then the Pakatan government cancelled it. Uh, in, in retrospect, I think they should have just reduced it by 3%, not to cancel the whole thing. But cancelling, they've done it, so they've gone back to SST regime, the old regime. Now, Tengku Zafru talks about bringing back the GST. I know why he's thinking of bringing back the GST. Because the GST is a revenue for government, and government revenue is difficult, okay, to say the least. Huh? Government revenue has not been great. So if they introduce GST with the intention to collect more revenue, that revenue will come from the public yeah, through a tax, which is a consumption tax. Whether that's politically clever or not, I, I'm not sure. But whether it's a better system overall for the government to collect money, yes, it is a better system. So the fundamental question comes into play is this. If the economy is not doing well, do you tax people more? Yeah. If the government don't have money, do you tax people more? If the government use that money for good and actually do something good without corruption, then yes, it's worthwhile. But if the government tax you and then use it to give more corrupt project, then you have to fight it. The GST is just a tool. Yeah, Is that too efficient? It's more efficient than SST for sure. Yeah? The question is whether you want to introduce and at what rate you want to introduce and for how much money are you trying to get out from the people. Okay, next question, please. Okay, so the other day we were discussing about uh, the Sapura bailout. So my question is, if uh, the government was to help or bail out Sapura, would this open up to more and more companies seeking that kind of help also from the government? Yeah, so to be to be absolutely fair to the Malaysian government, I mean the bailout is not a recent phenomenon. It's in 2008 when all the banks and insurance companies in the West needed bailing out, too big to fail, they did it. The question is, Sapura, such a crucial company that if you don't bail out, are they going to collapse the economy? The answer to that is no. Sapura is an important company, but not that important. It is not a bank. It is not an insurance company. You know, if you don't bail out a bank and the bank collapses, all the depositors of the bank will run, right? That's a different thing. Well, if you don't bail out Sapura, how many people will lose job in Sapura? Why not allow somebody who has more money take over Sapura. Why does the government need to bail out Sapura when it's a private company? Well, it's a publicly listed company but owned by the private sector. Of course, the Malaysian government have shares in it. If you continue to pump money into there through PNB, is it going to return anything or not? Yeah? So it's not so simple. Uh, are you there to protect jobs? Is it a crucial industry? No, it's not such a crucial company where you need to bail out. Then is the, you know, if they have like 30,000 jobs or 20,000 jobs or 10,000 jobs, what's the impact of not bailing out? I think those kind of things need to be disclosed before the government makes a final decision whether to bail out or not. To me, I don't think they should bail it out. It should be treated like every company. You mismanage, you overexpended, you take on too much debt, you pay for it. Lah. They've got such thing that during the good times, you make a lot of money. During the bad times, someone has to bail you out. There's no such thing in that. There's no such thing in the, in the world where you're entitled to receive government's support. Okay, next. Right. Hi, boss. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. 
Oh, Bala. Okay, you go first. You go first. I'm letting you be the. I'm being the gentleman now. You go first. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Serene. Uh, I've got a question actually. Uh, the question is, we know that the uh the projected GDP is increasing, and the minister, the finance minister, have also said that um the economy is recovering. However, the sentiments on the ground still there's a lot of negativity in the ground. People still have no confidence that it's increasing. There's a lot more um unsettling experiences that are happening on the ground. So I am just wondering where's the disconnect here? Okay, it's quite simple. Uh, the minister, uh, minister of economy and the minister of finance. In fact, all government ministers out there, their job is to paint a picture of confidence, right? I mean, we don't blame them because when you look at data, and especially in the first three months of this year, without the Ukraine war factor in, it looks quite good, right? So of course they will project the image that the the economy is doing better, and that's because maybe elections around the corner, maybe they want to to influence confidence in the market yeah they have a function to do that but as the ukraine war develops and and expand it seems to be never ending and the impact on global economy has started to come come home it's also important for the ministers and the government to project a real picture because if you continue to say that things are really good but people cannot buy chicken yeah people feel that everything has gone up look 10 minutes ago before this program started right i wanted to buy some new chateau cock okay i play badminton the chateau cock i bought in march was 77 ringgit a tube okay now it's gone up to 87 ringgit a tube that's a 13 percent increase you know are you telling me that uh you know the economy is good i have to come out another ten dollar for a tube of chateau cock i mean that itself is 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 a is a real issue that I face. What more other people face, like buying things, anything out there. So the government, if they continue to say everything is rosy, but the people experience differently, then what will happen is the government's sayings will be considered by the public to be lies. And that's going to be even more damaging. So at one point, every at the end of every quarter, the government should take a stock take on what is really happening and try to tell the truth. Of course, the truth is subjective. You know, but you cannot be so far off from what is happening on the ground. So, Bala, your question is very good because you don't believe whatever the government is telling you. Uh, we don't experience it on the ground. So, at what point will Tengku Zafro, the Prime Minister, all these people actually tell us something that is realistic Yeah, while still yeah. giving us some hope? Okay? Next question. Okay. We have got Iskandar with another question. Okay, I thought Serene um... is next. No, no, Iskandar. Let's do Iskandar because ah. he's, he's going to go for dinner. Apparently. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, what should us Malaysians do with uh, the ringgit falling down? I mean, trembling. Uh. Okay. So, uh, well, you there's nothing much you can do. Like, I mean, a lot of things that we consume is foreign, right? I mean, you go to a supermarket, you buy a pack of pasta. That pasta comes from Australia, comes from you know other countries. Because like, I only know the Australian pasta that I buy, like, right? You can say that I don't buy because pasta is now more expensive because it's foreign, it's brought in, the currency is weaker, right? But a lot of people don't have that, that choice. So they will need to consume more. But I would say that at least try to save more money like, if possible. Cut down on the unnecessary spending because the pasta has gone up 10-20%. Like my shuttlecock from China, that's gone up 13%. I suppose I have to use the old shuttle clock longer. I like make it last for three games in the, instead of one and a half games, right? So that's the only thing I can advise you. I won't advise you to try to punt the market, buy buy this currency, move that currency. I, I don't think a lot of you are in that position to do it anyway, right? So, uh, you know, try to maintain and, and feel and try to consume less imported goods. Try to keep and save some money because it can get quite bad if the stagflation becomes global and lasts for a year or half a year or a year. Okay? Yeah? Next question. Okay. Next one Ross. is Serene. Serene, oh, okay. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> so, a few days ago, Thailand has legalized the trading and uh, using usage of marijuana. Do you think Malaysia is ready for that? Medicinal uses, of course, not recreational uses. But do you think Malaysia could one day go along that same line? Well, I, I, I don't think 
that the Malaysian government is ready for it because it was it has been raised a couple of times. Even Ketum, right, has been debated at least three, four years. If I can remember when I was a, you know, a couple of years ago in Parliament, we, we debated issues regarding Ketum and cannabis is a spin off of this argument, right? The the use of cannabis for CBD oil, which is a health product, right? Um, it's a global phenomenon. Many countries have jumped onto the bandwagon. Thailand, our neighbor, I mean, Malaysia actually considered uh, this marijuana planting or, or hemp, like, it's not marijuana, it's hemp planting in Malaysia uh, about two years ago under Pakatan even. Okay? It just hasn't made a lot of progress. CBD oil was super hot. The stocks of these companies were super hot maybe a year ago, less so now. So, uh, you know, Thailand jump into it because, you know, you can grow hemp in this equatorial belt much easier than, you know, in the northern states, now, for sure, right, or Western Europe. So there are advantages for us to plant hemp, but whether we can pass it through Malaysian legislation, I think very difficult, yeah, not at the moment. You know, we still have very old laws on, on uh, drugs. We have a drug problem in Malaysia, please, huh? You have six, seven hundred thousand people on drugs, on marijuana, on all sorts of things. So to open up now without tackling the core issue, uh, even with you know death penalty, with very stringent laws, is not tackling. I don't think opening up is going to help a lot. Yeah, it may be a recognition that it's okay to do certain things. You may reduce the population in prison, but I don't think we're ready for it. Seriously, if you have very mature uh, society and you have all these things in place we can talk about it and we can maybe open up over time right but for medical purposes of course okay uh, next question uh, so I have a question boss I actually have two questions one was related to the death penalty but I'll start probably with my economic question first okay. so I think I keep seeing news about the labor shortage and especially how it's affecting the palm oil industry. So, I mean, this has been going on for a while now. Apparently, uh, permits are not being, uh, approvals are not coming in for the foreign workers to come in. Do you see a lot of money being lost to, you know, the government's hesitancy to approve uh, foreign workers coming back to work in, uh, palm oil, in the palm oil industry? Okay, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because, uh, you know, I see in the National Recovery Council and we look at the numbers. I mean, palm oil prices are all-time high. So what you have in the industry is you see a lot of fruits, but not, not being harvested because they are short of workers by around 30%. So you can do a simple correlation and say, look, you have 100 fruit, 70 gets picked, 30 doesn't, right? That 30% is a loss for the government in terms of revenue, in terms of export, somewhere around 10 to 20 billion easily. Yeah. So what they need to do is they need to bring in palm oil workers, but we have a lot of problems because there is also allegations of misdoing, corruption, all sort of things. But the system is not perfect. There is a gateway software controlled by one company. I think a lot of people, I don't want to, want to talk much about this issue because I think what, what should happen is the government should actually initiate, initiate multiple gateways for this kind of thing to process it. And also to the MACC must make, a, make you know, an attempt to investigate this issue because I know a lot of companies apply but cannot get. Yeah? And then there are a lot of agents going around offering special services. I, beyond that, I don't want to say any more. Yeah? Okay? So sometimes government policy, you get great economic prices, but they cannot motivate themselves to produce a, a system or policy that allows to meet this market. That means bring in more foreign workers immediately. Okay? Now, we do have a policy to discourage foreign workers over a period of time. But when you're trying to recover your economy, and in the sector of palm oil especially, you do need foreign workers because you can't get Malaysians to work in those sectors. For factories, you can still get Malaysians to work. So there is this balance that you need to find on these foreign workers. Okay, but that's another, that will take another half an hour discussion. Okay, your second part of the question is on something else? You're saying? The, 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 uh... 
removal of the mandatory death penalty. And I'm just curious, you know, because there's 11 legislations that will have to be amended for that to be the case, um, for that to be actually part of the law. So do you think that legislatures will be keen to amend those 11 acts, uh, including the Dangerous Drugs Act, as you were talking about earlier, boss? I, if I remember, we do have a policy where the judges have a right to decide. That is already law. So that is part can, of the DA, yes. Yeah, they, they, can, they can say, look, if you're guilty of a drug offence or something, they can elect to say, no, there's no death penalty here. You, are, you have to serve a life, life sentence. Okay? Right. The question now is whether, yeah, the question now is whether we want to retroactively, uh, you know, take all the old existing cases. Because if, I, if I'm correct, there's about a thousand people on death row. Right? Now, let's put it this way. Like, it's a moral question for all of us to consider. Uh, if you hang a thousand people who are on death row, is that going to stop the drug trade? That's a fundamental question. No. Statistically, no. Right? We know you know. And then, out of a thousand cases, let's assume one percent of the case or two percent of the case, and this is the case of that that uh, that that chap in uh, Nagendran. Nagendran yeah, in Singapore. Yeah. You know, if say one percent of these a thousand people are actually, you know, have mental disability, didn't have a good defense, they were beaten up by somebody to confess, then is it worth to kill anybody who is actually innocent? Right? So I think as, a, as most developed countries, as most countries that are enlightened, they rather dispense away with any form of death sentence and they, you know, they, they maintain the, the fact that, you know, sentencing should be about rehabilitation and in extreme cases, death, murder, extreme drug cases, then you're talking about, you know, a life sentence. So it's a question, when are we ready to do so? When are we going to say that we're finally developed and enlightened and that we care and we know the judicial system is not perfect, right? When are we going to do that? So that question it will be up for debate amongst members of parliament, uh. Of course, some yeah. members of parliament uh, want to show that the crime fighting. You can you can fight crime without being difficult and wanting to kill people. The question is, all these crime or wannabe crime fighters, are you willing to kill an innocent person mm -hmm. in the name of fighting crime? Come on, uh, please. Yeah. Right. So, so you know, unless we have a hundred percent fair judicial system, then you can even make a case for capital punishment. But we don't have that, so there's no case for capital punishment, at least from my point of view. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, next question. All right, boss. Uh, we have some questions from the public. I'll just put okay. them up. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. We have a question from our beloved uh, ex officer, Wong Ivan. Um, <laughs> he said he has no chicken price related questions, but he has two questions here. Do you think that a tiered petrol subsidy will work better than a blanket petrol subsidy? For example, only subsidize those who pump less than RM50 ringgit at a time. Okay, that's um, a good question. We'll go to the second question later. We, we, you can okay. read out a second and later. First thing, Ivan, good to hear from you. We haven't heard from you for a long time, but uh, I hope you're well. Uh, the first question is whether a tier system, I think it can work, but you have to go and ask first the B40, right? How much is their petrol bill uh, uh, a week or month, lah, right? We know, for instance, most people pump, uh, you know, B40 will own usually a very small car or motorbike. And to, to pump a full motorbike is like $8 or something like that, you know. Yeah? But a kanchil may be like 50 ringgit, right? And that one, one month, uh, one, one week is about 50 ringgit. So if you do a tier thing where you give only 50 ringgit, 50 ringgit, you know, for four weeks, then you are basically subsidizing currently at $2.05 for the 50 ringgit. Your pump la. and that helps all the B40 owners. Okay, the question is when you hit the middle class, is the middle class also going to suffer inflationary pressure? Are they going to be happy? Right, definitely for the upper class, we cannot give a single cent of subsidy, and that's why they have Ron 97. But a lot of upper class people also switch to Ron 95, right? So then you work out for the B40, uh, the, the M40, right. What is their pumping rate? Is it 80 bucks a week? Uh, then put the tier for 80 bucks instead. Okay? So, I think shaving or saving any money and not supporting the richest people is probably the only way you can go forward in this current global price on, on oil 
where the subsidy burden is now going to be 30 billion if you continue on this project trajectory. So let's try to reduce that subsidy to say 20 billion instead of 30 billion. Okay. Now, second part of the question. You want to read that, Bala? Yeah. So the second question is in relation to the shortage of migrant workers in Malaysia, especially in the plantation sector, would it be feasible for the government to allow refugees and asylum seekers registered with the UNHCR to work as well? That is, that is a possibility, but of course, you have to ask the refugees themselves whether they want to go to a plantation, right? And uh, plantation owners generally want to know whether, uh, you know, are they coming as, as a person or are they coming with four kids, three, you know, a wife, uh, you know, whatever. Lah. And then it becomes a bit more complicated for them, okay? To me, if the refugees are already in the city, they're there, obviously, because the city life offers better prospect for them, right? So it should be given to the asylum seekers that option where they want to work. You can't go and tell them, look, you want to work, you must go to plantation. It's not going to work. Yeah, the way I look at it. Okay, but we, we have a long way to go on this UNHCR thing. I'm going to attend a UNHCR thing. Uh, I think a few days time, Serene has my, has my calendar. But I'm also going to speak to Tengku Zafro tomorrow and KJ because I have a National Recovery Council meeting tomorrow in, in MOF about the UNHCR uh, insurance scheme that we're trying to work with. Okay, that's taken a long time for them to come back to me. La. And to be fair, la, I'm just, uh, I understand they're busy. I understand they want to worry about other policy, but I've been chasing this for about two months already. La. So tomorrow I'm going to corner them and get a real answer from them. Okay, thanks Ivan for the question. Okay, let's move on. We have four more minutes. Do you have more questions out there? Yes, we have some questions from the public as well. Uh, this is from Mr. Thomas Yeo. Do we have statistics for the financial management of the country for PN, BN government? Yes, I guess yes, we do. At, the at, trend. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so what we do is at the at the budget, budget time, which is October, November, the budget is usually table in October, but some, I think this year it could be a bit later, I'm not sure. Lah. But by October, Thomas, they would produce their budget and they have in the budget, there are a couple of books. One of the books, it talks about the government spending the previous year. Yeah, the previous two years, lah. previous two years. Because let me see, give you a simple example. The year now is 2022. When they write the budget, it's for 2023, right? Since 2022 is not over yet in October, they will only give you the results or the financial management of the country of 2021. Get it? Yeah? So you get to see 2021 reports for in, the, in October 2022. Okay? You won't get the 2022 because 2022 got another two months in October to complete which is November and December. Okay? Yeah? Okay, next question. We have a question from Mr. Al Takif. How do you find the issue of poor man maintenance in Bukit Jalil Stadium? Is it because of a domino effect of mega projects in Malaysia while we can't afford to pay for maintenance? Same goes to Prasarana, MRT, MRT. NRT that's a that's a good question, uh, Najmi. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's generally... I mean, the uncle talk, like, I'm not going to say about Bukit Jalil itself, because I have no idea. I haven't been to Bukit Jalil for like, you know, three, four years already. I, I, I don't have any inside information about the poor maintenance of Bukit Jalil. I know there's a report about Bukit Jalil under the Public Accounts Committee where they say it wasn't maintained well. But I think the problem in this country is we, t we tend to build a lot of nice things, nice monuments, mega project. We just have no capacity or no willingness to maintain them, you know? That's the crazy thing. So if we don't have this culture of, you know, we have a culture of building grand projects and we don't have a culture of maintaining this kind of thing, then maybe it's time for us to sit down with architects. Yeah? Factor in when you build a construction project or anything, factor in that we need to build materials that lead low maintenance. Yeah? Low maintenance because we have no culture of maintaining anything. So that's the bad thing. Lah. Yeah? So fair question. The answer is, I think, it's a cultural problem, okay? But we can solve this cultural problem by clever thinking, by using better architecture, better design to have minimal maintenance cost. okay? Next. All right, um, we have reached our 30-minute mark. Uh, however, we have one more question to go. Would you let's like do to the that? one question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. It. 
So this is from uh, Mr. Tan. Hi, YB. We are facing technical manpower shortage. What do you think? How do you overcome as, this issue? Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what's technical manpower shortage. I assume that we don't have vocational training. Like, it's for like people you need, like technical people like engineers and uh, plumbers, bricklayers, that kind of thing, right? If that's your question, Tan, we do have, the government do spend a lot of money trying to do vocational training. I think the shortage is the fact that whatever talents we produce in this country, uh, when it comes to construction, tiling, electrician, all that kind of thing, they have a tendency to go to Taiwan, go to Korea, go to Japan, and they call it Tiu Fei Ke La. Bought a plane and jump off and don't come back. <laughs> they illegally work, them, work there and then because they can earn more money. So that's something that we, we, we need to, we, we can address it only by saying that we pay them better. Yeah. So if say Japan is paying, you know, 20 US dollar an hour for electrician, if we can pay $10 an hour for electrician, that will discourage our technical capacity to move to Japan. Yeah, or to be working illegally in Japan. So I think there's there's a lot of things that you hear about this because when I go to small towns, right, and you talk to the, the locals there, why where are the young people? You know, everybody is like 40 something. They say, Oh no, my son is an electrician, he works in Korea. Uh, my my son in law is a tiling expert, he does he does tiling, but he's working in Japan. So I think those are the issues that we do have to resolve. But our vocational training site, we do have a lot of facilities. And every year, the government talks about TVET, TVET, TVET. Mm -hmm. Are we really producing them or not? Hard to say, lah, Tan. Yeah? But at least from the Chinese side, Chinese-Malaysian side, we can see there's a lot of those kind of activities from the smaller, smaller towns around Malaysia. Okay? Hopefully, that, that gives you an indication of what I'm thinking. So, that's it. Half an hour. Painless. Yeah. That is yeah? nice. So do uh, give us feedback whether you like this model, right? Where you want me to give faster answer, quicker answers, right? And Bala, I, I'll give you the last words to you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So let's do this. Um, so this will be our final uh, episode in this format. Uh, we will be moving to a new format very soon. Uh, it's going to be a physical event where YB will be taking questions from the audience. Uh, more on this event uh, coming up in our Facebook page. Please have a look at it. Uh, please keep your eyes peeled. We are still fine-tuning some of the details, but yeah, the event is definitely happening uh, this Saturday. Uh, sorry, this Sunday. This Sunday in the evening. Uh, more, more, more details will come up soon. So I'm um, looking forward to meeting some of you guys face-to-face. -face. Uh, we've always seen people commenting behind the keyboard. It would be great to see a face behind those those words uh yeah so looking forward um hoping to see this event be successful as well so we will be doing this uh in different events uh every other every every other week so just keep an eye for it uh that's all from us uh boss you want to say goodbye yep okay so so i'm gonna wish everybody a, a productive week ahead and also keep an eye out follow us on facebook because we are doing our town hall engagement right so we are happy to meet people on the ground because when we have a small gathering, 10, 20, 30 people, it's more interactive and I can actually hear from you all what are your major complaints about. Mm -hmm. And and we've been doing this for quite some time like previously, right, in, in Klana Jaya. We, we like the town hall format. And now that it's uh, endemic, even though there seems to be a small surge of COVID-19, so everybody please be careful out there. Uh, since we're in the endemic period, it's very important because I, I, there are a lot of economic issues out there. I'm very aware because I in, the, in my family, I do the shopping. I go to the supermarket, you know, and I can see, literally see the prices, right? So a lot of people have approaches. So when we do this town hall format, what we're trying to do is trying to engage and see what you're really thinking about. So yeah. if you have time, follow us on Facebook. And if you're coming to your taman, right? Come, you know, mm -hmm. come and see us. Have a chat. Because we'll be setting up booths at the site to take your complaints as well. If you're shy to ask questions directly, you know, at least come and say hi. You know, a lot of you are very loyal followers. <laughs> okay. It'll be good to finally meet some of you. Okay. Thank you so much and good night, everybody. Night. Mm -hmm.